ESPN's Trevor Maddich. Trevor, first and foremost, hope you enjoyed a nice weekend. And hey, as ugly as it was at times, BYU figured it out late. We got some positives and negatives to discuss in the 52-26 win. So let's start with the positives. What was the best thing you saw from BYU other than the Cougars winning the game on Saturday? It was a BYU passing game. I mean, on a day when the Utah Tech defense sold out to stop Puka Nakua. They put two guys on him, three guys on him sometimes. He had five catches for 53 yards. Didn't really dominate the game, but the rest of the receivers stepped up. Jaron Hall was accurate. And it wasn't just that there were guys running wide open all over the field all the time. There were plays where the coverage was tight. The ball had to be precise, and it was. The receivers had to win a fight for the ball, and they did on those plays. And, guys, we've talked about this over the years, that I hate it when receivers just want to receive the ball. It comes in, and if it gets there, okay, I'll catch it. No, we want those guys to fight for the ball. And we saw that happen on a number of occasions in this game. Those young receivers really stepped up. They really did, and Keanu Hill, as mentioned and seen in the music video, uh, six for 136 and three touchdowns. Uh, career high 456 passing for Jaron, second most in FBS. Caleb Williams was the only guy who threw for more uh, against UCLA with 470. Let's talk about the other part of this game, though, because BYU did trail after the first quarter. BYU did give up 26 points in this. BYU didn't cover. It was a little weird at times. Uh, what was lacking, uh, in your opinion, from BYU in that game? In some ways, the first half of this game was sort of a microcosm of some of the problems BYU has had, I think, in terms of focus, and, and you might even call it leadership. I mean, for goodness sake, they started out slow again against a team that they wanted to pound because of bulletin board material coming from the other side in the week before the game. And they talked about after the game how that was important, the BYU Cougars did, that they wanted to actually to, to make these guys pay for some of the things that were said. That's all well and good. But the way you do that is to play good, sound, disciplined football. And they ended up for the game with 11 penalties, 132 yards. In the first half, they were largely terrible on both sides of the ball. It looked to me like they were trying to, to, to make those guys pay for the things that they said rather than go out and make them pay by winning football. Let me tell you a story. Um, my rookie year in the NFL, the New York Giants came up to our team, the Patriots, during training camp to practice. And Lawrence Taylor, their Hall of Fame linebacker, uh, in a one-on-one -on -one pass drill, just went right around our left tackle. So after the whistle, the left tackle, as Taylor was slowing down, shoved him in the back. So Taylor looked up, looked at him, looked at the coach, and said, let's do it again. Went back there and lined up. Now, I'm this rookie, and I'm thinking, oh, no, what's going to happen next? Is Taylor going to hit him in the mouth? Is he going to punch him in the ear hole? What's he going to do, right? Well, what Taylor did was threw a move that was so spectacular that our guy didn't even touch him. Our guy ended up on the ground, and Taylor was around for another sack. And then Taylor didn't say a word. He just went back to his side, and the next guy stepped up. That's how you show people. You show them by playing better football than they are. Then if you want to give them some extra, go right ahead. But BYU in the first half played in a way that appeared to me that looked like they were distracted away from playing good football and towards some other agenda. And that certainly was the result in the first half. And that, to me, was disappointing. Trevor Maddich of ESPN is with us on BYU Sports Nation for another Maddich Monday. Let's talk about Puka Nakua. This morning, we learned that he accepted an invitation to the Senior Bowl presented by Reese's and... Now we're feeling like, okay, did he just make the decision that he for sure is going to the NFL? That's a conversation for future days. But in your opinion, is now the time for Puka Nakua to fully declare for the NFL? It's, it wouldn't be a bad time. He could certainly come back and learn to be more precise with routes, more precise and advanced in reading defenses. There's all kinds of things as a receiver that you can improve on. But there's two things you need to think about. The first one is that in the NFL, receiver used to be one of the hardest positions to break in as a rookie because it was so complex to read defenses at that level. But now there are so many college principals that have come into NFL offenses that young receivers are making an impact earlier. The second thing is that Pukunakua has shown himself to be a playmaker. I mean, an all-around playmaker, running the ball, catching the ball, blocking, all kinds of things. And because of that, he delivers and he takes a lot of hits. And it's not a bad thing to say, okay, I'm a receiver. I'm, I'm, he's over 200 pounds, but he's not, you know, a big old stocky, you know, running back of some sort. 
And so to take the next step into the league at this point, now that he has shown to be such a playmaker, might not be a bad thing too, so he doesn't expose himself to all the hits that he would have next season. So if he leaves now, uh, I, I couldn't say that it was a bad decision. I would say that, hey, there's lots of reasons to go. Do you feel the same way about Jaron Hall, Blake Freeland, and perhaps Clark Barrington as well? I think Jaron Hall... Uh, could go as well, especially with his injury history. If he finishes this season, finishes this season healthy, then for him to go now is probably, I wouldn't say it's a bad decision either. Again, he could come back and learn a lot more and, and even get better and prepare himself better. Uh, another reason to come back and prepare is because of the group of quarterbacks coming out this year is very, very deep. Next year, he'd probably have less competition that would likely be drafted ahead of him at that position. But at the same time, he doesn't want to come back next year and risk necessarily being injured like he has in seasons past. So he has to balance that. I think the guys on the offensive line, um, you know, when you talk about left tackle, you go. You, you've got a guy out there, Freeland, who is is got the the – the size, the characteristics of a left tackle in the NFL. I think Barrington at left guard is a guy that's very, very talented, but he's built like a left tackle. He's tall. He's not particularly stocky. He's a guy that may next year move out to left tackle and show the NFL that he can play that position. So he's the one that's most likely to me to have a good reason to come back rather than a 50-50 call. Trevor, let's have some hypothetical fun and say that Jaron Hall returns to BYU as they go into year one of Big 12 play. How would that shift your expectations for BYU in the win-loss column next year if Jaron Hall is back at quarterback? No, it would be massive. The the Big 12 is a really good league. They've got a ton of talent. You just look at the quarterbacks that are playing this year, starting with Max Duggan at TCU. I mean, then look all over the league. You've got transfers coming in from the Pac-12. You've got outstanding quarterbacks. And if BYU can't match that, then they'll be in trouble from a comparative standpoint. Now, when you same way with Puka Nakua, you need playmakers all over the place to keep up with what the other offenses can do. Now, the, the flip side of that is, no matter what the left guard, left tackle, you know, Barrington or Freeland decide to do with the draft for BYU, BYU will have an experienced and talented offensive line again next year. And they will also have Miles Davis coming back. The, the running back position should be um, a relative strength as well for BYU next year. And so they'll start with a core of, of the ability to run the ball and protect the quarterback. So even if even if Jaron Hall doesn't come back, if Puka doesn't come back, I think the foundation is good. And then you've got the guys that are on the roster right now at quarterback. But look at freshmen that may want to come in. Look at transfers that may want to come in to also compete for that spot. They would be starting with an experienced offensive line, running backs that can make plays, and one of the better young receiving cores in the Big 12. And so that would be a good position if you're not on the roster right now at quarterback to want to come and join this roster and compete with the guys that are already here and let the chips fall where they may. So there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic about BYU's ability to compete right away next year, even if Jaron and Puka don't come back. But if they do come back, then you've got to look at BYU as, as a contender for one of the top positions in that league. Let's hope so. That'd be awesome. I'm starting with make a bowl game and then building up from there, but that's just me. And let's see who the quarterback is, right? Um, which brings me to this. Perhaps the weirdest thing about this season is how much Jacob Conover hasn't played, Trevor. In your day, the backups played a lot. Like, Blaine was like a regular dude on the field, right, as, as a quality backup at BYU. Jacob Conover's played five snaps. So we can read into that a, a few different ways. One is that, hey, Jaron Hall checked the box of he can – you know, play most of a season. Hopefully he continues to play and is good, right, through the rest of the season. But also, like, why hasn't Jacob Conover played more? It's, it's been a little weird that we've only seen five snaps. I've not looked this up. I'm not going to. This has got to be the fewest times a backup's ever played this far into a season in, in perhaps BYU history. This is a little weird. Yeah, no. Yeah, it is weird. And there's a lot we don't know about it. So it's really hard to say that, hey, that's a good thing or that's a bad thing. I mean, I don't know. I know he's a talented player, but I don't I don't know why he hasn't come in more, especially in a game like this against an FCS school that finally in the second half as BYU started to pull away. Would have been a good time for him to get some experience, but but they didn't do that. You did mention something interesting, though, that uh, in allowing Jaron to play, 
he was able to continue to show NFL scouts that he can take the hits, he can make the throws, and all those different things. Look at what Stanford did last week against Cal. Yeah. For goodness sake, Stanford is down by 10 with five seconds to go. So they're not going to win this game. It's just not going to happen. It's impossible. They line up for a 61-yard field goal, Stanford does. With five seconds to go, down 10. And the kicker makes it. <laughs> so to me, that's the coach showcasing for the NFL or for the All-Pac-12 voters or whatever, hey, my kicker's really good, or to give him a chance to get that experience. There's all kinds of reasons that, that coaches do that. And so it is a mystery, though, and especially if Jaron does not come back next year, the, the current roster of backup quarterbacks on this team, I think, are, are a mystery, and I would love to see some emerging clarity going forward about the guys that are here. Trevor, we've talked about BYU's slow starts this season. Another one happened against Utah Tech on Saturday. What are your expectations for BYU in terms of starting quickly against a struggling Stanford team in the regular season finale? Well, I think that Stanford is looking at their players saying, what are your expectations for starting, uh, starting fast against a struggling BYU team? Right? So I, I think this is a, a tricky game for BYU. Stanford has lost four games in a row. One of them was last week to their rival. But... They also lost to Utah, UCLA, and Washington State. You know, the first two were ranked. Washington State's a tough team. So Stanford statistically uh, is really struggling on both sides of the ball. But they have a quarterback in Tanner McKee that people talked about as being, you know, a, a mid-level mid uh, draft choice, an NFL caliber guy. Now, he's had injuries at running back. The running back is the running game has disappeared. The receivers have struggled, but you still have a quarterback with the capability of getting hot. It's one of the reasons that BYU needs to start fast against Stanford to keep them from getting on a roll and kind of feeling finally we're going to have that good feeling heading, heading into the offseason. BYU needs to make sure that the feeling for Stanford is, oh no, here we go again. Starting fast, would love to see it, but that has not been a given for the Cougars for a long time. BYU and Stanford, it's the RMQB game. You know, I don't know how many games in history there have been with that situation, but that's what it is with the uh, Elder McKee and Elder Hall. Okay, let's finish with this. Zach Wilson with the Jets. It's not going great right now. Uh, weird finish right with a punt return for a walk-off touchdown yesterday against the Patriots. Zach has struggled. Um, how would you assess that situation, and how quickly do you think the Jets might go with somebody else, perhaps? They shouldn't go with somebody else. They need to let Zach continue to grow. He showed he's shown the ability to do things. It's just not consistent enough. And when you look at the guys around him, I mean, this is not an excuse, but I think it's fair to just point out that in the first quarter of that game against the Patriots, the starting center went out, the starting left tackle went out, and all of a sudden he's being swarmed by the Patriots defense. And they generally swarm the Jets offense anyway in his three previous games against the Patriots. He had two touchdowns, seven interceptions, harassed in the pocket all the time. So so in fairness, it wasn't like he was sitting back there and just making bad throws in clean pockets. The problem was in the press conference after the game. Now, keep in mind that this game was 3-3 three to three until late when the Patriots had that punt return for the game-winning touchdown. And both offenses struggled. The Jets struggled more than the Patriots did, but both offenses were struggling. But when, when Zach was asked whether or not he thought that he and the offense let down the defense by not scoring a touchdown in this game, he just said no. That right there is fodder for the New York media mm. and the national media. And he's taken so much heat for that. You know, I, I think he was just trying to stay positive. Uh, I don't know that he fully recognized what the reaction to that was going to be. But really, with, with a game where he struggled, and he did struggle personally, there were plays there that were there to be made that he didn't make. But then to say that one-word answer to that question opened the door for people to, to question his character. And I don't think you can question his character. But now the door's open for that. What he should have said was, yes, me personally. Everybody else did great but I didn't do what I needed to do, and I will continue to get back. That's all I needed to do. And I think that's his attitude. I think that's how he, he prepares. I think that's how he leads his team when the media is not around. But that one moment is a moment now that he's going to have to overcome. Trevor, as always, fantastic insight. Great to catch up with you for another Loaded Maddich Monday. Be well, and we'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, guys.